I'm giving a short talk about network stack wide privatization. Um, yeah, virtual madness and insanity in the network stack. It's actually not even virtual, it's real madness and insanity. <laughs> Unfortunately. <coughs> so. And it ends up Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm skipping that. Penning did a good job at that. Um, this is what I will cover. It's like more or less what is virtualization? Why should we do virtualization in the network stack? How is it made and how to use it to short life demo? So, what's virtualization? That's the first hit I got in Google. <laughs> so, it's about computers, and uh, you can put a computer in a computer, and so you can compute while you compute. It's fantastic, it really explains it. Um, so what's, it, what's the, the idea behind it? So it's mostly you want to separate local resources into domains. Like on real hardware, uh, we do it in software, which is a lot more crappier, but you can do it there as well. Um, you want to have multiple instances of something on a single box. Um, it's more or less like having multiple sandboxes in one big sandbox. And Everybody has to play in this little part of it. Um, why network stack virtualization? So, yeah, it's mostly a management thing. This cartoon is on my door. Yeah, <laughs> on mine too. <laughs> it's pretty tells like what's all about. Everybody comes. We need to do virtualization, um, but that's not really the reason why we're doing it. Um, the idea behind network stack virtualization is that you can have the same network configured multiple times on a single machine. Um, so you can have like a firewall, have, you can concentrate multiple firewalls on a single firewall for multiple customers. And even so they all have the same networks on the back end, they don't create conflicts as they would at the moment. Um, because of this, you can most probably simplify some really complex setups. Why don't you um, believe that? No, I don't know. It's, it has more pictures. Like, <laughs> um, virtual stack net, uh, like th the whole thing about MPLS, which is also some, some, some other really magic buzzword, um, is that you actually need some sort of network stack virtualization to make really use out of it. Um, and my reason for doing it is because it's cool and we can do it. So if your network setup is like this, or maybe like that, <laughs> then it's time to think about like trying to get this stuff a little bit, yeah, putting think, everything back to. I didn't think to the loud pictures of this machine. <laughs> <laughs> So there are two ways of doing that. Um, you can create, like, you can duplicate the network stack multiple times. You can, like, run multiple QMUs on your system, which is even more heavier. Or um, you can go and put everything in the, in the all the globals of, of the network stack into a container and pass that along <coughs> and have the, like, multiple network stack running at the same time. Um, each of these network stacks are completely independent. And that's what previously did with V image. And um, I think it's a little bit, yeah, massive. Because it's, it doesn't really scale, in my opinion. So the other way of doing this um, is we already support multiple writing tables in OpenBSD since quite some time now. Um, um, two years or something. I wish to not be reminded of writing that code. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, that was horrid. Um, so, a routing, our routing table store uh, the layer 3 and the layer 2 for reading information in them. And so it's actually quite obvious that when you have multiple routing tables, you could probably also allow like packets to, like all the other information 
belonging to that to somehow bind into there. Um, the other thing is you want to have the interfaces to belong to a routing domain. So you have a way, you need to have a way to, to bind interfaces to a routing table. And then all in all, you have to tag the MBOS while they fly through your network stack and ensure that every time they do some sort of lookup, it's doing it on the right table. This is what we're doing now. Um, this is more or less how our hacking works normally. We just start hacking, and when we're good, it's it's actually working. Um, Henning and I are, I think we're a little bit masochists because we're hacking on code that's Roger Evil and Bob as well with his <laughs> that's a, that's a nodes. Different, so, different instance of horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all evil. So the network stack, that's a picture of another um, talk I, I gave in other places. Um, it's more or less looking like this. It's tons of functions and they're somehow managed together. We have uh, the, the different IP, IPL levels like softnet and the network part where we have always like massive queues in between. Um, we have a lot of functions. We have certain functions like the, the forwarding functions, IP forward on the left and right side, or the IPv6 function where it's in, in the middle, where right. pack, where rattle gobs happen and, and packets get forwarded again, or we go up into, um, into TCP UDP um, where the sockets are listening. So. Uh, in the end, it ends. It, it is that we have to fix like the forwarding case. We need to to get the the, the socket layer to respect routing domains, and all in all, it's just small fixes everywhere through the stack. Um, this is more or less what I now said. It's we modified into input routines at the bottom to tag the packets belonging, this packet belongs to this domain. Um, we changed the lookup functions to use this ID to do the lookup. Um, I had a massive fight with ARP um, and uh, I looked into the network discovery code of IPv6 and I got so scared that I didn't do it until now. It's evil. Um, Surprise. It's about I think the network discovery code of IPv6 is about the same size as our IP, the whole IP code, it's massive. Um, what's a little bit open is still the, the PF part because Henning has a monster diff standing outside and until he, when he commits that I can move on forward. So we're a little bit in, in a lockstep situation at the moment. and. Um, as usual, rinse and repeat until bug free. Um, at the moment, nobody's screaming, so uh, I think the most obvious bugs are outside of the, the network stack at the moment, but who will hit new ones? Um, yeah, the evil details. Um, we need to ensure that packets never cross from one domain into another without our intention. Um, so when you have a response generated because of an event, like an ICMP port unreachable message is generated, we need to ensure that that uh, MBUF and that packet is in the same domain as the one that came in. So we have to figure out which places we're actually creating a, a response and sending it out and making sure that the response is tagged correctly. Um, the user land needs some sort of way to to, to specify uh, which sockets um, belong to which routing domain. Like, you open up a socket and say, and, and, and tell it, I, I'm belonging now to the other routing domain and uh, after that the socket is only there. Um, there is more planning. Um, one of that is uh, it would be nice to, to inherit like a, a uh, the routing domain across like uh, process invocations, so that you can say like 
I want to have this running in routing domain 2 and then start Apache and Apache will automatically uh, get the information because you don't want to fix up every application that opens up a socket. Um, we need a magic way to pass traffic between domains and uh, that way is PF. Of course. But the um, question is PF is a soft break. <laughs> Yeah, we could do it like NFS over soft rate. Yeah, um, and then we have like the R tables from PF and the R domains, which are not completely the same thing. In a uh, an R domain is is a completely virtualized network stack, so an interface belongs to an R domain, and um, you can have multiple R tables on that. So currently, the R tables are still all bound to the table zero, like to the default table, and it's not possible to have like a secondary routing table for a certain domain. But I'm working on fixing that. Um, yeah, live demo. How does this stuff work? Now I have to exit this one. So um, I have on this uh, box, I have two QMUs running. This is Top two is so Pinky and Brain. Um, they have both the same IP address. Um, those things are connected through ton zero here and ton ten to my laptop. So um, I want to have ton zero. I want I want to have that in a, in a other routing domain. So I do. Uh, I'm just configuring the, the, the interface into a different domain. Um, which is now on the top line, you see it. Yeah, there it is. On the right. On the right. right. Oh, on the right. Yeah, over there. It's just about me. So um, you can configure an IP address if everything goes right. One slash uh, twenty eight. Voila. Now run out minus n show minus ida. Ton null does not show up in my routing book. <coughs> because it's actually in a new table, so I can use minus t one and suddenly I see the network. But ping does not answer because I'm in the wrong domain again. So I can go. We have more or less in the, the usual suspect tools like ping, traceroute, and a couple of others. Um, you put it in one. one. Not it's in one, <laughs> not two. Oh, yeah. Failed. And it works. So I can do the same thing with the other interface. I can go to ten or domain two. Use the same IP address. And I can ping the other box. I can do the same thing with netcat and C minus N. So I can do netcat. <coughs> and it shows up. I can connect to the other box. And again, it shows up. So um, these boxes, even though they have the same IP address and they're connected to the same box, they're actually totally independent of each other. Um, this is more or less the demo that I can show at the moment. So this is more or less what I wanted to show. Um, I want to thank Yanni and Johan for this great event and for the Fuzz System Hackathon and uh, Theo, Henning, David and all the others to actually allow me to, to 
to do this evil shit in the network stack. <laughs> yep. Any questions? Everybody's confused. Rather what, than what, checking arguments, why didn't you we could stuff into a proc so that everything is inherited? Yeah, it's more or less that. The, the trick is like in far away future, it would be probably some sort of jail system would be possible with that in a much cleaner way than it is done in FreeBSD at the moment. Because FreeBSD, you have this magic, crazy hack with IP addresses. Um, their, their, their network stack is completely confused in, in jail. So uh, this allows us to do it actually in a better way. But I'm not really sure if we like if we ever go down that road. Yeah, third prop is the place to put it in for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, DOG. Yeah, three line dev. Uh, will the BDP and OSPF daemon get support for those R domains? Um, OSPF already supports it, oh. um, at least in current now. Even in. Four six, I think it's even possible there. I'm not sure if when when I committed the last bits, but I think it's in four six. Um, you can start it up with an R domain, and it will run only in that domain. The problem is you have to. Uh, I do not check if the interface that you actually specify are in the correct domains. That's uh, currently a little smallish problem, but. Um, Without that, it's working. So when you're careful, it works. Uh, BGPD has already support to actually uh, put routes into various routing tables, but um, the socket is currently not like the socket that we use to uh, to bind uh, sockets into a different domain is not used in BGPD at the moment, but it will come together with crazy stuff like MPLS and support. Any other questions? DLG. Is LDPD smoking to this yet? Mm, no. Okay. It most probably... Uh, I still have to get my head around LDP. Um, the normal idea in MPLS is that you have to default table which LDP uses to announce everything and the virtual domains are just a tag that is then redistributed through normally BGP with the, the MPLS VPN extensions so I'm not really sure if we need to to have a lot of support for that in, in LDP but maybe other questions 